you, Great if you've book. never read, I highly recommend. Uh, he talks about the worldwide internet like you know 20 years ago. So. Weren't you also known as a uh, Space Rouge occasionally? <laughs> 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 now, well, that comes out because of Space Ronics, which is where Space Rouge comes from. Uh, that's a whole other topic. <laughs> topic. So we'll save that for you can take another drink. I can take next one. Yeah. Dill. All right, Dill. I go by. I've gone by Dill, Dill Dog, a bunch of other. Dildo G. Uns, 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 unsa unsavory names. Um, I guess. Uh, yeah, I, I don't really use a handle anymore. I've mostly been in a cave writing code for the last few years. Uh, I did uh, a lot of work uh, over the course of years uh, at AdStake and now at Veracode on uh, decompilation technologies, making sort of the theoretically possible uh, decompilation process actually tractable for um, you know analyzing large binaries. Um, the uh, the name Dildog. <laughs> I actually want, I, pick, I wanted to pick something that sounded um, dirty. Well, not unoffensive. I guess that's not the word I was looking for. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I'd seen a lot of handles like names like Evil Super Killer or Lord Digital or some other thing that was just too, like, maybe pretentious. I wanted to have something that was approachable. So I picked the name without quite realizing that it needed a the, the hyphen in the right place. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like it's like the experts exchange. You know, if you take the hyphen on yeah. expert. anyway. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so uh, the Dildog name is actually the uh, uh, the name of the Dogbert character from the Dilbert comic strip before it was syndicated. Uh, Scott Adams had named all the characters Dilbert, Dill Dog, Dill Cat, Dill, etc. And uh, the editors wouldn't let him print it. They censored it and made him change the name because they had the substring dildo in it. I actually didn't notice that part of the thing. <laughs> <laughs> I always capitalized the two Ds, so it, 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 was, it wasn't obvious to me until I got laughed out of pound hack on IRC when I first came in there. Um, but uh, yeah, well, that's basically it. And does anybody quickly want to talk about um, uh, Kingpin and, and Brown Oblivion and whether they're still in the business? Well, uh, King, Kingpin um, now has uh, Grand Idea Studios, and he does a lot of hardware hacking. He designed the uh, the uh, the badges for uh, DEF CON last year, LED, and uh, I think they had wireless capability. Uh, last two years, I think. Last two years. So uh, he's uh, he's on the board of advisors for uh, Make Magazine, um, and uh, now as as Mudge was saying, he he's uh, working on a documentary, much like the the Monster Garage type uh, shows where. Uh, People are basically doing hardware hacking. Yeah, it's a do-it-yourself show, isn't it? I mean, like a yeah. regular thing on uh, Discovery Channel or something. Uh, Discovery, I think he's going to air in September. I think he told me. That. Okay. So, so and uh, that. Brian, um, as far as I know, is working um, on wireless systems, um, secure military wireless systems. I just I just saw him uh, okay. four days ago. Uh, he was actually up in uh, Boston for one day. He had to come into BBN. Uh, we used some of the boards that they were doing. So yeah. he's yep out there doing his hardware and wireless stuff. All right, so let's get into the meat of this. What's this uh, taking down the internet in 30 minutes comment? Where did it come from? Did you ever really try it? <laughs> <laughs> well, it came from me, unfortunately. Um, and it was uh, something that the media uh, keyed in on during our Senate testimony in 1998. And what we were talking about was uh, BGP, well, were BGP attacks against the national access points or metropolitan area ethers, which are the major uh, kind of muxes for um, long haul uh, intercarrier exchange of information. Uh, it was entirely possible to do. Uh, actually, uh, the Loft uh, web server sat uh, on a cable being pulled out of May East, so anybody could actually get there, and nobody had BGP filters in place at the time. Uh, even with the current best practices of BGP, um, they don't have the protective mechanisms in place for it. The, uh, it, it actually did happen a few times as well, just accidentally, where people will basically black hold the entire internet um, uh, by publishing bogus routes accidentally. And anything you can do accidentally, just through you know sloppy work, you can intentionally do. Uh, and this will keep it down. It went down for like a couple hours here or there. Case uh, in point: YouTube and Pakistan. Oh, you, yeah, very similar one just happened with YouTube and Pakistan. You can take countries off pretty easily. Uh, what's happened? What's happened? Yeah. Well, Estonia is <laughs> a bit different. Uh, what what what's happened since then is that we've gone to a lot of private peering agreements uh, with places, and there are a lot more internet exchange points or internet peering points. So, uh, rather than 30 minutes, it would probably take 
about two and a half to three hours to do now. And this, this is all the actual engagement. There's still a fair amount of setup to get your stuff in place as there was before. So, but so, that's what that was. So does the fact that it hasn't happened, does that mean that, that hackers have become beneficent over time? Or, or why, why, why haven't we seen one of these, these you know, I guess total outages you of the internet? You can't conduct a cyber campaign and go after a target if you've taken out your means of the campaign. <laughs> All right. Anybody Somebody's else? been spending too much time with defense. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think, you know, the, the trend we're seeing overall is as soon as things move from, you know, vanity and bragging rights to criminal activity, um, which is we're seeing with a trend with malicious code over time, um, we're seeing um, wide scale destruction um, go against the aims and, of the people that have the capabilities to you know, cause harm on the internet. They don't want wide scale destruction, they want targeted attacks, even if those targeted attacks are you know, 50,000 CEOs or 50,000 machine, uh, machines, it's still under the radar. It isn't something where the whole internet jumps up and says, oh my god, we gotta solve this problem, which is what happened with things like Code Red. Um, it's under the radar, no one's really noticing it, and it's a, it's a really, it's a, it's a problem. It's something that, um, you know, I don't think we have the, uh, the means to deal with these um, under the radar types of attacks that are going on. Do you want to make the analogy that Dan did in his speech about the symbiotic relationship? That no. Things yeah, that's well, that's, a, that's, another, that's another point. And I think Dan was, uh, you know, Dan took something that uh, Mudge said probably, I don't know, five or six years ago that he noticed um, on machines that were compromised that they were the best managed machines in the network. They were up to patch level, they were hardened. Um, Their log know, files weren't filling up and choking the system. Extraneous, uh, <laughs> extraneous processes that weren't being used for any purpose were removed. Up, yep. so, and, uh, so Dan made this analogy from the medical analogy from going from, you know, um, basically, uh, you know, virus to parasite, which a parasite wants to have the host live, to symbiotic where the symbiote actually wants the host to get better. Mm -hmm. And so I think that that's a great analogy on the machine level, but we're seeing that on the internet level with things like, you know, like the storm bots and things like that. It doesn't want to harm the, your productivity. It wants, it wants your network to run well. So maybe we'll have, you know, the storm bots actually making uh, the pipes run better. Who knows? <laughs> well, an, an, another thing that, that we're seeing is we don't, we're having attacks that are coming out that are able to actually target geographic areas. When we saw the, the distributed denial of service attack against the major root name servers that provided .org and .mil, and it only took them out in particular geographic areas, this is because they've started using something called Anycast uh, for uh, responses for DNS requests. So within a particular area, you're always going to, you think the same IP address, but that's a locally pushed out responder to you. So now, if, I mean, if you could do this with BGP, which you can, you can take off particular autonomous systems, you can take off particular organizational uh, areas, uh, but even in the, the distributed denial of service with some of the defensive mechanisms they've put in, you're able to say, I want to take this particular region off the net and keep them off the net, and that still enables me to use the rest of the net's resources or the components that I want. This is a much more devastating attack. So, so are we safer or not as safe as we were 10 years ago when you guys were in front of Congress talking? Uh, well, talking we're more mail. dependent and the security hasn't, hasn't improved much, so I guess that by definition means we're less safe. Anybody else have a I think yet? I think education has improved about security vulnerabilities significantly. Um, uh, the fact that a lot of the attacks um, are becoming automated has scared the pants off of people enough that I think that we realize that the defenses have to become automated too. Otherwise, we'll never keep up. Yeah, but your, your so. education level varies depending on your audience. Yeah, I mean, clearly. your audience is probably, your education people, level is probably pretty high. Well, my I, audience, they need these. There's, one, there's the people who consume code and people who write it. Um, you know, if you don't write bugs as much, then there's less problems to exploit. Uh, this may be just a simple linear factor. There may be always configuration issues. Um, you know, there's always a human element, and we do have to find ways of dealing with that. And, and, and to harken back to Dan Gear's speech again, you know, some of these problems may not get solved until control is wrested from the user of the machine um, and placed in the hands of somebody who actually knows what they're doing. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, you know, people should not be allowed to use their computers or that somebody should be controlling it or monitoring it, but that security and you know, uh, it may, may become dependent on a certain amount of um, centralization in terms of management of, you know, the things that are vulnerable. 
It's, it's a thought. I also think that uh, to some degree we are a lot better. I mean, if you look back, I mean, back in 98, not many companies had security contacts and whatnot. They had no internal process and procedures around receiving vulnerability information. And I think that's really changed from an operational standpoint. I think uh, companies, I, I mean, some companies may be better off than others, but uh, for those that are controlling some critical assets or have uh, some very valuable information and whatnot, they have a lot of the process and procedures in place to actually handle the incidents. Because, I mean, it's, there's always going to be zero days out there. There are always going to be vulnerabilities and exploits and whatnot. But you really need to have the strong process and procedures on the back end to know what to do and how to correctly handle that situation.